Hello everybody <coughs> um, and welcome to this lecture on uh, freight planning and uh, air transport. Uh, <coughs> before I start on this uh, today's topic, I would like to repeat some of the main issues that I dealt with last time when we talked about uh, land-based transport and intermodal transport. And the reason for that is the, the failure, the technical failure, when we taped the, the, the last lecture. So I will just take you through a few issues. Uh, you should pay attention to, to the whole set of slides in the lecture notes. But I'll just uh, comment upon some of the, let's say, more theoretical issues, just to, to, to summarize that. Uh, when we deal with road transport, <coughs> We have a system where we have a moderate investment cost per unit. And with unit, I mean a lorry, a truck. So <coughs> the supply of capacity is rather flexible. It's rather flexible. You can expand with one truck, and it doesn't cost that much. As compared to, to, to sea transport and rail transport, where the fixed investment costs are, uh, are, uh, are substantial. And you need quite a lot of volume to to be able to to uh, to uh, <coughs> make those investments profitable. Door-to-door -door solutions are common with no consolidation on the way, <coughs> where uh, there might be consolidation as well. Um, in particular, when road transport is is used in connection with uh, with the road, um, sea or rail transport. Uh, there are, there is consolidation of many trucks coming in to a terminal, consolidating the goods, uh, the cargo, on uh, in for instance into containers, uh, on rail, or on ship. The road transport creates pressure on road capacity in many areas, and that's uh, <coughs> that's uh, that's a kind of important observation that road capacity is limited. There are, uh, there are queues, congestion, meaning that uh, the, traffic, uh, the traffic speed is very slow. <coughs> and, um, and, uh, and that is what we mean by pressure on road capacity. Pressure on road capacity. In addition, you have uh, traffic safety issues connected to, to, uh, to, uh, to road transport, but that is not uh, the issue here. External effects from road transport mainly slow down of average speed in the transport network. We see that around the bigger cities, and we see that uh, um, also in uh, parts of the motorway network in Europe. And um, just to remind ourselves about this external effect issue. If you have a traffic volume and per, uh, per shipment, per, per, tr per truck, you have a price and there are some uh, private costs and there are some social costs, social costs of this transport uh, activity. And as far <coughs> as you have excess capacity in the road network, the cost per truck using the road is quite constant. So whether the road serves 10 vehicles per, uh, per hour or uh, 1,000 vehicles per hour, it doesn't matter too much. But when we come to a point where the capacity starts to, to uh, become limited, we get com congestion. This is private costs. That is the costs that the, the, the truck or the, the cargo owner has to, to live with as a, as a consequence of this capacity constraint can see that this is a capacity 
constraint. Capacity constraint. And this, <coughs> this will then approach this capacity constraint uh, asymptotically. So this is the cost curve for a, uh, a truck. And if we have a demand like this, in, an, in uh, let's say, in the middle of the day, not in the congested hours in, hours in the morning and in the afternoon, we have a, uh, a price here equal to PC which again is equal to what we call the social marginal cost. And the reason for that is that we, we assume here that the, the, the trucks are paying the social costs, social marginal costs of road wear and tear, accident costs and so on in, uh, at times of day when there are no capacity problems. But <coughs> when we have uh, a high demand at times, and those times may be when uh, in the morning and afternoon peak, for instance, um, then we observe that we have gotten a higher cost, private cost, because of the extended time costs and inventory costs that are connected to the slowdown of traffic. But the problem, if you recall from a, from a course in transport economics, here is that we have a social marginal cost in congested systems, which are higher than the private costs. You see the difference can be quite large. And that has to do with the fact that when a lorry enters into a congested road network, it slows down the speed for all other users as well. So that difference is the time costs that one extra vehicle in peak hours, the, the time costs that are imposed on all other users. It may be a matter of uh, just a few minutes, but aggregated uh, over all vehicles, it can be quite substantial. So this is the external costs of congestion, right? So <coughs> what, we, what we need to do here, if we are going to, to, uh, to think in terms of an, an, uh, an optimal solution, is to bring the market clearing point up to the, uh, again, to the point where the price, the price is equal to social marginal cost, which is uh, greater than the private costs, which is greater, larger than the private costs. So then we are here, and this, this amount, we can term T, where T is the congestion charge, charge that we have to levy upon each truck. So the difference here between the private costs and the social costs are T, which is the road user fees that, uh, that a truck should pay in, con in congested hours in the network. And what we see here QP is the, the volume if they are only charged equal to the private costs, whereas this is the volume if they are charged with including T to, to cover also the social marginal costs. So we see there is a slight decrease in traffic from this pricing 
uh, t to include the social marginal costs into the cost function of the trucking companies. So then, if you are, if you are, a, a, if you are a shipper, or if you are, a, if you are a consolidator, you will take this T into consideration when you are trying to shift cargo between road transport and, for instance, other transport modes, like rail or road. No, uh, sorry, uh, C rail or C. So this is one observation. That the general observation is that all road users, car road cargo users, should pay the social costs of transportation to obtain a good distribution of cargo between road transport, rail transport, and sea transport. This picture is kind of uh, it's a kind of the same as we have here on, on the slide, because this d zero is equal to d a here, where we have uh, a demand, we have the short run marginal costs, and here we have a, a cost curve called the long run marginal cost, which is the cost of road usage including capital costs. And this uh, vertical line is, uh, is the capacity constraint. So when we are <coughs> in a situation with a capacity constraint and the demand dB is higher than dA, it's higher than the short-run marginal cost, but the short-run marginal cost here is actually shaped like this. And then it goes like this, straight up because of this capacity constraint. Here I, I have drawn it as a, as a curve. There it is simplified to a, a kink line, which goes straight up, following the capacity constraint. But anyway, to include um, the consideration with respect to capacity, we need to price PB in a situation where we are starting to get congestion. Here, we are only concerned in this uh, illustration, we are only concerned with the short, uh, with the social marginal costs. The third <coughs> panel here, with the demand DC, is a very, very high demand. And then, we see that PC is a very high price for using the infrastructure. In this situation, we should expand the road capacity from this point, where the, the original capacity constraint, and to the new capacity constraint. In this case, the peak hour traffic has a willingness to pay, which is high enough to expand road capacity. So for this peak hour traffic, we will price equal to longer run marginal costs, and we will have a slight increase in capacity from X to XC. When the traffic drops again, down to this situation, which will be in the evenings and in the, in the, uh, during nighttime and so on, we are back to this situation where we price equal to short run marginal costs. So the, the price will vary according to the to the capacity utilization of the infrastructure. So here I discussed pricing to in, in internalize or include the external time cost for all other users of the road infrastructure. That is one discussion. And this discussion is about uh, <coughs> Pricing according to capacity. And for simplicity here, I have just used the social marginal costs. And the SR is short run marginal costs, and LR is long run marginal costs. 
And the long run marginal cost includes capital costs of expanding the infrastructure, building better roads. And so there is an investment criteria for expanding road capacity that the willingness to pay for new infrastructure exceeds the long run marginal costs. So <coughs> the reason why I'm telling you this is that how you, tr how you price the various transport modes will affect the distribution of cargo between transport modes. So if you price the use of the different transport modes according to uh, principles for, uh, for socio-economic efficient pricing, that may affect the distribution of cargo between modes. This capacity pricing scheme can be used also for rail if you get problems with capacity there, or even for a ship if you get problems with capacity there. And then you, you send a signal to the consolidators, the shippers, about the costs of transport. And then the consolidator may think, well, perhaps road is becoming uh, too expensive. Perhaps we should consider rail or sea instead. So the logic behind such consideration is kind of presented in these, uh, in these illustrations. Then the rail transport. <coughs> the reasons for, uh, for, uh, for rail transport is, uh, is sort of presented here. There are increased, increasing road con congestion, and hence increasing the rail market share could be favorable to transfer some of the cargo away from road to rail. The energy use of rail transport is favorable. There is, there is uh, not much friction between, uh, between rails and the, and the wheels of the, of the wagons. Uh, but you may have problems related to rail track capacity. And you may also have problems connected to increased lead time variance because uh, when you are doing uh, rail transport, in most cases, you are dependent upon terminals. Uh, you are dependent upon um, terminals, the rail company, the, the consolidators, and perhaps a truck com trucking company who feeds cargo into the terminal. So there are more, a larger number of players involved, and that may increase cause increased lead time variance. What I'm saying, when I'm saying increased lead time variance, is actually the danger of delay, delays are much are higher. And we have seen that in some cases in, uh, in Norway, when, uh, when there has been uh, various kinds of disruptions in the rail transport network, which has caused problems for the, for the, for the cargo. I just uh, I mentioned this uh, project that was dealing with rail transport from Germany. No, sorry, from uh, from uh, not from Germany, but from uh, Romania here, and to Rotterdam, and to take and to to of course uh, load and uh, unload cargo along the, along the this this corridor here. And the one reason why I find this, this project interesting is that if you go from Constanza here, you can go through uh, the, the Bosporus Strait, you can go down here and through Suez Canal and to the Eastern Asia, to and from. So the sea leg from Southeastern Asia and to Europe can be shortened if there are convenient ships, Suez Max uh, container carriers, for instance, and you get a shorter sea leg, as compared to a situation where you go through the Mediterranean Sea, around Spain and Portugal, and up here with a ship. 
or for the bigger container ships they go around uh, Africa which is which is a much longer sea leg and all this has to be traded against the economies of scale of having bigger ship ships I guess that has been uh, discussed in a in a in a previous lecture. But the thing is here, <coughs> how should we go about to try to improve and strengthen a rail link like this, which may be at, at least conceptually quite viable. But today, this link is, in a, is not in a very good shape. The, 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 rail, uh, um, the rail infrastructure is not too good at places. And there are some coordination issues between countries and between, uh, between uh, players in this, let's say, transport supply chain. So one way to start working with such a project is to try to, to identify where are the customers and who, uh, and who are the customers and what kind of cargo do they do they uh, use or ship? So here we see some cities along the along the corridor with different kinds of cargo. Utilized means um, containers. Non-utilized may mean palleted good uh, cargo, uh, and so on. So you see there are some cities where needs have been uh, elicited from studies <coughs> and the way you see the bigger there are the, the bigger cities are, are listed here. There may be others as well. So first identify needs of the customers. What kind of cargo do they uh, use? And of course if you're going to talk about making investments for the future you also need to have some kind of uh, perception about development forecasts when it comes to the amount of goods that are going to be shipped here when you have the volumes <coughs> you may start working with business models and for a for a system like this you could think of uh, a system where you have a 3PL company, third party logistics company, which are taking care of uh, warehousing, contacts between, uh, between uh, cargo owners and the, and the transport operators. They are trying to consolidate needs and to optimize how those needs should be transferred into use of a certain transport network, be it rail, sea or road. And here we are uh, talking about rail. So <coughs> these service providers, forwarders, third-party logistics companies are taking care of the coordination between cargo owners, train operators and infrastructure managers. Those two companies may also be in a kind of relationship that is important for understanding how this market works because the train operators are uh, are today uh, more or less independent from the from the infrastructure uh, managers and there may be some issues between them as well if the infrastructure uh, doesn't work uh, there may, may be a discussion between the train operator and the infrastructure manager about whose responsibility that should be, uh, or who should take the responsibility for that. And at the same, <coughs> you have the same in the other end of the, um, of the transport chain, which, which goes from here, from the suppliers, and to the end customers, and vice versa. There are different numbers here, but that is just for illustration. But there is a kind of a coordination in both ends here. And the customers, sellers or buyers of the product are relatively small players so they need somebody to take care of the coordination so that is one business model 
A second one <coughs> is where you have what we call anchor customers, where you have direct contact between customer and train operator. And that is uh, perhaps uh, convenient, where you have big customers that can, that can actually deal with the train operator directly because they have so, so uh, large volumes that they are in able to, 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 let's say, fill a whole train with their cargo. So then you can, you can in, in some cases, skip the intermediary company, the 3PL, third-party logistics provider, the consolidator, and go directly with the, with the operators. That is another business model. And these can be mixed, depending on the, on the nature of the, of the shipments and the size of the, of the customers. Third one <coughs> is a situation where the third party logistics provider that takes care of warehousing, coordination, setting up contracts with transport companies and so on, they are actually they have actually integrated themselves with the train operating company. To my knowledge, no of these uh, big uh, um, the vertical integration between transport operating companies and uh, and the service providers has not included infrastructure management that is taken part of by by separate separate public entities. But the, the point here is that you have an integration between the consolidator, 3, 3PL company, maybe. Uh, the consolidator may be a 3PL company. And the train operating company. And an example of that is, uh, is uh, DB Schenker, which is also uh, operating in Norway. DB stands for Deutsche Bahn, Deutsche Bundesbahn. So they have an integrated service with uh, consolidation, trucking services to feed the rail transport system, and they are also operating trains. So that may be a, that may be a third, uh, third solution to this. Which one to choose? whether you should go with a separate train operating company and a service provider as separate entities, or whether they should be integrated. Depends a bit on the, on the shape and size of the market. If there, are, if there are possibilities to extract economies of scope, meaning that it is beneficial for one single company to, to be able to, uh, to do different uh, operations within a common framework, being both a uh, forwarder, 3PL company, and a trans train operator, whether you get benefits from that, either in terms of scope or in terms of scale, uh, you need to have at least one of those in place before it is, uh, it is a good strategy to integrate with the as a train uh, operating company and uh, a, a service provider in the, let's say, uh, consolidating goods and also perhaps uh, feeding goods into the, into the rail system. So the market structure for rail <coughs> is often characterized by public ownership, train operators and tracks in particular. Historically, it was designed for national needs and not cross-border operations. That means that there may be issues connected to cross-border operations and signaling, system, signaling systems, electronics, communication, and so on. But that there has been some efforts taken to harmonize the standards for, uh, for different countries, uh, particularly within the European Union. They are often monopolies due to high fixed costs, particularly the, the rail infrastructure operators are often monopolies. 
they are they are not parallel railings that are operated by different infrastructure operators but you may have competition on the tracks from different rail companies the rail transport has often been considered as being production oriented focusing on capacity scheduling and so on and not with so much working with end customers to ensure that the rail system is is up to the needs up to serving the needs of the of the transport uh, companies and the uh, um, consolidators cargo owners but this is about to change and one objective with this retrack project was actually to try to to merge uh, the needs of being efficient in production and being efficient in terms of uh, serving market needs to align those issues was one objective of the retrack project yeah so this is just uh, just a small illustration of the main characteristics of the Norwegian rail freight market three three different market segments basically container transport system solutions over shorter distances and uh, and the flexible trains with wagons for pallets cars and so on container segment is the big biggest one um, 75 percent in terms of uh, tons and even more if you uh, measure it in terms of ton kilometer because the container segment does long haul the, the transport goes over longer distances <coughs> they are in direct competition with the road transport and as a part of an intermodal chain with consolidation of terminals and at the moment there are capacity problems in the rail network uh, with respect to cargo and particularly at the main terminal in uh, in Oslo Elnabu terminal in Oslo is is constrained with respect to capacity the system trains <coughs> are often door to door with large volumes and with rarely connected connections to to uh, to trucks they go from factory to factory and they are business to business transports not business to customers but but mostly business to business the flexi trains consists of different types of wagons to fit the cargo and you see all those kinds of uh, transports when you observe what's what's going on on the on the rail Next. the cost structure in rail operations the cost the IAC stands for average costs and the average costs may shift downward because of more efficient infrastructure or rolling stock operations so that may be one observation that we can make that when you become more efficient uh, you, you use the infrastructure more efficiently and per unit average cost per unit is reduced from AC0 to AC1 and that the direct effect of that is that the price is going down from P1 to P2 because price equal to average cost before the more efficient uh, operations is in this point and after the more efficient operations it's the, the average cost and here is the demand curve is reduced to P2 if you <coughs> if you recall this discussion um, that can be also included in that uh, illustration on the on the screen there I'm just now drawing up one average cost curve. We can say that this is AC1. We have the demand. 
we have the, the marginal cost. And we get, if we are going to go break even in financial terms, we have this P2 price. We see that this is after we have made the system more efficient. <coughs> so this is demand. Uh, and uh, this is AC1, this is the marginal cost curve. And then, if we now get a situation where this is, this is road transport, and this is rail, and this is, this is a cost, uh, cost curve for the rail operate, uh, operations. If now, we are introducing capacity pricing in the road network because we, do, we have capacity problems in the road network. You see that the change in volumes are sort of reduced. The, the, the volume on road is slightly reduced. And that can be transferred to rail transport. If you imagine that this volume is transferred to rail transport, And then we transfer demand from road transport to rail transport. So we, we and that means that we shift the demand for rail a bit outwards. We get more demand because we get transfer of, of cargo from, from ro road. And that means, again, because of the scale effects in rail transport. And here we assume that we have available capacity. It's further reduced. To P3, because of the scale, the scale effect, and the scale effect is, uh, is there because of this formula, AC is equal to the initial investments in infrastructure and in the rolling stock, which is expensive. And the average cost is equal to the investment costs. And then the, the marginal costs. Sorry, I'll use Q here. As a function of traffic divided by the number of trains that are used, or the number of wagons that are used. So we see that when Q, if this is constant, and Q increases, average costs is declining. In the interval where this is constant, average costs are declining with volume. So we see that efficient pricing in one segment of the cargo market, road, can affect demand in another market, in the competing market, rail. Shift demand outwards, reduce prices, and as a, as a result, the system becomes more well-functioning when the, the uh, cargo owners are, uh, are faced with the, with the true costs of, uh, of, uh, of shipping uh, cargo with different types of, uh, of, of, uh, of transport companies. If we should strictly address economic efficiency here, as long as we have excess capacity in the, in the rail network, we should actually ch charge the, 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 uh, the use of the rail network with marginal costs. But because of this 
average cost function, we would then, if we do that, we would we would simply uh, be be at risk of going going broke. Because if we consider this situation with a shifted demand and price equal to marginal cost, we should have had this area is a financial with diminishing average costs and constant marginal costs. So <coughs> in this case, uh, the train operator will have a deficit which has to be covered by the authorities. And um, it's not very popular to subsidize freight transport. So that's why we are, op we are using price equal to average costs as a, as a practical approximation to a kind of efficient pricing here. And if the demand is fairly, if it is fairly inelastic, we don't do much, we don't do too much wrong by charging equal to average costs. Particularly not if the demand is fairly, is fairly high. But I'll leave that discussion. Do you get the point? Optimal pricing in the road sector may cause kind of side effects in the rail market with increased demand, lower prices, and um, a more, a better distribution of, uh, of activities. And <coughs> to, to wind up this, uh, this is a, a way of taking this discussion a bit further. Here we have, we have um, a graph or a panel where the length of the x-axis is the total amount of cargo that is shipped between two destinations. Right? So this length of this line is the total amount of cargo, total volume. Now, from the right-hand side and towards the left, we have a steadily increasing cost curve. And that is the cost curve for road freight. And we assume that the costs are increasing with volume. And this is a very simplified assumption. But we assume that it increases because of congestion in the road network. Yes. So it's the, the costs are increasing with volume, road transport, because of capacity problems. Straight line. From the left to the right, we have the cost curve for rail freight. Same cost curve can be applied to sea freight. This, same as this one, it is a average cost curve is falling with volume. So the higher the volume, the lower the costs, it falls. So if everything goes on sea or rail, the costs is on this level. If nothing goes on sea or uh, if, if a very little amount goes with sea or rail, the costs are much higher. And this is generalized costs. Costs of time, what you pay, and so on and so forth. 
pay for the shipments, uh, for the transport activity, and so on. But the, mi the main idea here is to say that where do we have equal costs between rail and road operations? Well, it is at this point. Below that point, rail or sea has much higher costs. So we won't use rail or sea transport unless you are able to attract M2 amount of cargo. If you don't manage to, to attract such amount of cargo, nothing will go by sea or rail. Everything will go by road. So we end up in that point. So the blue point here, the this one at the left, is the critical mass point. You need that much of cargo to be competitive against road transport. But if you, if you reach this point, you see that the costs of increasing the volumes by, by, uh, by rail or sea becomes less, the cost becomes less as you move along here. So the, so the market for rail sea transport is strengthening itself up to this point. Beyond that point, road transport will be competitive, right? And the reason is that beyond this point, the volumes that goes by road are so small that you don't have the, 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 the capacity problems in the road network. That's why road transport is more favorable uh, in the when, when the cer beyond a certain market share for the rail or sea transport. So you get the point? You need at least this amount to become competitive versus road transport. If you go beyond what you call a critical mass point, you get a competitive advantage as a large scale operator, road, no, sorry, uh, rail or sea, up to this point. So when, when you read EU documents or Norwegian uh, reports and textbooks, where it said that we should, we should really make it possible to transfer cargo from road to rail or sea, then they are talking about reaching actually this point where road and, and sorry, where rail and sea transport becomes competitive. So you need a certain volume to become competitive. Unless <coughs> you are in this point, you will tend to end up there with everything, or at least most of the cargo going by, by road. But if you are able to make rail transport or, in or sea transport more competitive by becoming more efficient, you shift the average cost curve downwards by making the rail sea transport more competitive as a system. You may achieve that by reducing costs, shifting the average cost curve downwards. What happens then? An interesting observation is that the critical mass, mass point is moving to the left meaning that you don't need that much of cargo feeded into this system to become competitive. You also see that the cost advantage of increased market shares for rail sea transport is also increasing. And the, sh uh, and the point where the, the market share for, uh, for rail and uh, sea transport is sort of emptied is here because of the cost reductions. This is a very simplified picture. The main message is that it's important to be aware of this critical mass point, that you get enough cargo to actually start off a, a kind of a self-reinforcing process. Because when market share starts to increase from these points, the cost advantages start to emerge, and they will attract more and more cargo up to these points depending on the cost structure of the of the intermodal system. 
And when I talk about rail and sea transport, because this is this simplified uh, illustration is valid for both, then we are actually talking about an intermodal solution because you need also a, a, a truck transport at both ends to, to feed into the system. But that doesn't change the, let's say, the, the theoretical, this theoretical model. It's, I think it's quite illustrative to illustrate the points of critical mass, cost advantages with scale in intermodal transport, uh, sea rail transport, as compared to door-to-door -door road transport. Door-to-door -door road transport may suffer from, uh, from congestion. And of course, if you are addressing road improvements as a part of this picture, you can do that as well. By shifting this cost curve, let's say you can rotate it downwards like this. If you improve the road system, you reduce congestion problems. And then the cost increase will not be that sharp. And then the road transport network may become gain competitive power. So this is a quite dynamic picture. So this was basically the, uh, a repetition of what I said about rail transport, road transport, and modern transport. Uh, which had the most, let's say, theoretical content. So this is for you, and then I will break, and then I'll go on with freight planning and air transport in the next session. <laughs>